All right, you're good to go. <clears throat> oh, good. Hey, Matt. And the webinar is now live. All right. Oh, I'd like to um, welcome everyone to the July meeting of the North Sonoma Valley Municipal Advisory Council. And um, I'll call the meeting to order. And please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, is there a flag on available? There we go. I pledge of allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America. America. And to the Republic, and to the Republic for, for which it stands. Which stands one nation, a nation under God, God indivisible, 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 with liberty, liberty justice, and for justice for all. Justice for all. All right, thanks. So I'm um, I'm Arthur Dawson. I'm the chair of the of the MAC, and uh, now our vice chair Damon Doss will call roll. Thank you, Chair Dawson. Um, Kate Eagles, member at large, here. Mark Newhauser, member at large. Here. Matthew Dickey, SVCAC. Here. Angela Nardo Morgan, Glenella Eldridge. Jed Cooper, Kenwood alternate. Here. Damon Doss, here. And Arthur Dawson, here. chair. Did I forget? Oh, Vicki Handren, did I mention her? Did I call her name? I'm sorry. So we have. Uh, she will be here. I was communicating with her earlier today. So, but. Okay. <clears throat> um, thank you, Chair Dawson. And thank you, uh, Vice Chair Doss. So, um, just a couple of, of uh, procedural notes. Um, question and answer and chat are turned off for this meeting. And when public comment is open, please use the raise the hand function on Zoom to be recognized and promoted to speak. Um, if it appears at any time that this meeting has been hacked, uh, we'll immediately end the meeting and a reschedule for a future date. And as chair, I'd like to um, just welcome everyone to this meeting and thank you to members of the public, community organizations, the press, North Sonoma Valley Municipal Advisory Council members for your participation and engagement in this meeting and your dedication to the community. Uh, for those of you who are with us for the first time, the North Sonoma Valley Municipal Advisory Council, or MAC as we call it, uh, serves the communities of Eldridge, Glen Ellen, and Kenwood. As the most local arm of county government, we represent people who live and work outside of incorporated cities like Sonoma or Santa Rosa. We are, in a sense, a country town council. Like other advisory councils in Sonoma County, we were established by the Board of Supervisors to act as a two-way communication channel. The MAC serves our, as our community voice at county government, as a means for us to learn about and access county resources, as a place to identify challenges and opportunities, and a place to innovate solutions in partnership with our supervisor. Our bylaws limit us to issues concerning transportation, health and human safety, community projects, and emergency preparedness. Others can be added at the request of our supervisor. While we do not have land use purview, which is covered by the Sonoma Valley Citizens Advisory Council, we will be hearing from Permit Sonoma later this evening on current projects within the MAC area and how the public can get information on those and give input. And during public comment, as always, we welcome your thoughts on any matter of concern. Um, we're gonna shoot for a, a meeting of two hours or less. If we reach two hours, um, I'll check in with uh, the council members and we'll decide whether to uh, take a short break, uh, continue or to push the remaining agenda off to next month. <clears throat> All right, um, so now we're moving on to uh, the approval of the minutes from June. Um, Here, Dawson, can I add one more thing? Uh -huh. uh, yes. uh, just just, awesome just so everyone knows, I got a text from Vicki, our neighborhood lost power just before uh -huh. five. For some reason, my house didn't lose it, but Vicki has, so she okay. was on a joint, just so we know. But okay. um, right now, it's, it's a bit of a struggle to get on. Thank you. All right, thank you. And welcome, Supervisor Gorin. Yep. 
You're on mute, supervisor. <laughs> That's the only reason I have Ariel on my staff, so that she can tell me you're on mute. <laughs> Thanks, Ariel. <laughs> Happens to the best of us. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. Great to have you here. Um, so we're right at the approval of the minutes from last month. And um, anyone have any um, amendments or corrections to the June 16th minutes? Yes, Council Member Eagles. I do have a couple, uh, as a matter of fact, should I, I know our minute taker's not here. Should I go ahead and just rattle them off? What's the best uh, process? Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm filling in those minute takers. So um, you, can, you can say them and, and I can make the corrections in the minutes. Okay, great. So just really quickly, in item two and seven, um, Arthur Dawson is, is referenced. Of course, Arthur wasn't here last time, so I think it should be um, Damon Doss for those references, and that's item two and seven. I think you'll see them, Ariel. Um, same for item six, Mark Neuheiser, Neuhauser is referenced. Um, he attempted to address this issue, so maybe the context for that comment needs to be slightly tweaked because Mark wasn't there either. Um, and Angela asked me to request a change. Uh, Nick Brown's name is just not quite right. She may have misspoken. It, it was um, listed as Jed Brown and should be Nick Brown. Um, and lastly, very quickly in item three, I just wanted a clarification here. There's the fifth bullet point down, um, uh, uh, talks about the response to the intersection of 12 and Arnold where a collision happened that's been brought up by a member of, of the community a couple of times. And the response is, is a little unclear. I, I would love it to have this addition. So it says, Susan Gordon mentioned that she was going to bring this to the county, um, um, but it wasn't in, in, in the direct context of that intersection. And I would love it to say, Susan Gordon uh, mentioned she was going to bring, um, uh, follow up with Johannes on the 12 and Arnold um, issue or something like that. Um, it, which is accurate, and I did, and is I'll that, report on that. Okay, yes. thank you. And, mm -hmm. and so, because it, it I'm sorry, let me let you back up a minute. The way it's written right now, Raleigh, you'll see it's just not clear that that was an action item on that very specific thing. And I thought it was important enough to mention it. And sure, thank and, you, Supervisor and not, Gordon, for confirming. Yeah. Not not to belabor it. So, is this after the it says public comments or questions from the public in response to the supervisor? Is it after that? Section? Yes. So that, that next bullet point says, any response read the intersection of 12 Arnold where the collision yeah. happened last year, period. And then it goes on to something else. And then you'll see Supervisor Gorin, I will follow up with Joh Johannes. Yeah. Okay, Katie, thank you. Right there, I will follow up with Johannes on the intersection of 12 and Arnold. And that's it, sorry. I know that's right. really in the weeds here, but <laughs> I wanted to mention that one. That's it, that's it. thank you. That's good. Thank so you, Councilman Regals. I would move with those changes to go ahead and accept the minutes if we can do that. Um, and and uh, let's just see if there's any other amendments. Or oh, correct. excuse me. Yes. All right. Um, Council Member Eagles, if you would like to make a motion to uh, accept the minutes with those changes. I, I would. I, I so moved. I second. Second. And all in favor of uh, the uh, amended minutes from July. Um, Please say aye. 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 And anyone opposed? All right, the motion to accept the minutes has passed uh, unanimously. Um, <clears throat> let's see, do we, do we have any uh, public attendees, um, Hannah? Uh, yes, we do. Okay, um, so this is an opportunity for a public comment, um, public comment uh, is for items that don't appear on the agenda. Um, uh, we haven't received any written public comments. So this is just, uh, if you'd like to speak now, you're, this is an opportunity to speak. Uh, if you'd like to speak, um, use the raise hand function on Zoom, or um, I suppose you can also probably go like this, however you can get our attention, but hopefully we, we will uh, see you. And we're gonna limit comments to uh, two minutes um, and then, um, Hannah, we'll put a timer up so you can see uh, how your time is going. And then after all the public comments, then uh, board members will have an opportunity to uh, respond. And then, um, then we'll move on from there. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Any... Okay. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, Chair Dawson. Yeah. Um, we have three raised hands at this time. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. 
And are you able to see that timer? I, I am, yeah. All right, so I am going to um, unmute our first um, attendee. You'll have two minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that's me, Alice Horowitz. Hello, everyone. Hey, Alice. <laughs> so I, I, have a, I have a question. In, in light of the fact that the SDC specific plan alternatives are going to be coming out soon, um, coupled with the fact that it seems like wherever you drive around in Sonoma County, it looks like there's housing developments going up right and left. So I find myself wishing, and, and maybe it already exists, but I haven't found it. I, I'd love it if there were a comprehensive website or web page that detailed various things, such as the state requirements for housing in Sonoma County over X amount of years. And then all these developments that are currently being built and developments that are coming down the pipeline. And with these developments that are being built and ones that are coming down the pipeline, like how many units are they? Where are they? What kind of housing are they? How much of it is affordable housing? Um, I, I'd, I'd love to have this information at my fingertips and I assume a lot of other people would too because as we're asked to consider the alternatives, it'd be really great to know what percentage of this housing need requirement Glen Ellen is being asked to absorb. And I understand it's not quite that easy that projects have to pencil out, but there has to be a minimum number at which projects will pencil out. And if we had a more comprehensive understanding of what the need is, what the requirements are, what's actually out there and what can pencil out, I think that that would help the public have a much better um, capability of tackling those alternatives. So there's my two cents. And if that doesn't exist, why not? And, and, and can it? And there we go. Goodbye. All Thank right. You. Thank you, Alice. Appreciate it. All right. All right. And our next commenter is Jay. You should now be able to unmute yourself. And you'll have two minutes. Hi, thank you. Good evening, everybody. I just have a little uh, housekeeping administrative uh, sort of point to make for maybe for my own benefit. Uh, I, you've had some great speakers at the meetings here and um, lots of good information. And I find it would be very helpful if you could list, possibly include with your uh, packet materials, any slides or projections or uh, PowerPoint that your guests bring uh, to bear uh, to the meeting because they're very useful for me to reference uh, in the long term, but they're also generally just chock full of good stuff, information that you want. And I'm not sure, Ariel, uh, if I've been able to, to dig up videos of, of the presentations, if they're there. I particularly find, uh, well, it's all, it's all good, but Susan's uh, presentations are often informative and I find news tidbits in there that you just don't dig up anywhere else. And uh, the uh, same thing goes for uh, the presentations you make. We get very interesting information from County Insiders. So uh, are there videos available when we need to, to go back and check on them? And it would be possible to include the PowerPoints with the documentation as they come up. It, it helps to follow along. Thank you. That's, that's it for me. Thank you, Jay. And our next commenter, this is for Larry. You should now be able to unmute yourself and you'll have two minutes. Welcome, Larry. Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, I wanted to go back to the minutes because there was no uh, opportunity for the public to speak about the minutes. But uh, if you'll notice on the first page, you quoted me when in fact that was Supervisor Doran's comment, not mine on the first page. Uh, my question was not in the minutes, but my question had to do with, can we expand the funding for the fire department and extend over to so that we have a climate change approach that has the fire department involved on an annual basis in educating the local public? Because you know, right now we have this feeding frenzy of going around and getting everybody organized for uh, preparation, but we're going to have this with us forever. And I think we need to start thinking about the county taking on an educational function instead of doing it through ad hoc uh, group, groups that are funded, you know, as we're funding them this year. 
or next year, but we've got a problem there. The, the people who know most about what's needed are the fire people. And if we added to their staff and added to their function of going out into the community, I think that would be helpful uh, because they're the ones that we're relying on. And uh, the other, the comment uh, got lost, I guess. And so we have explanation from the supervisor, <laughs> but the comment I made was lost in the uh, woods somewhere. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, and in, in terms of the thing that Alice was saying, yes, we do need more public education about the planning process. And as Supervisor Gorin has said, the existing wealth of information that's available through the county is very hard to, uh, to access in a way that's comprehensive for something like uh, what are all of the effects, what are the cumulative effects of all the plans that are going on? Now, perhaps our speaker today will help that help, help us tell us what the cumulative effects are. That's Thank all. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, I'll just make, to make a very quick response to Larry, unless there's someone else who's ready to speak. Um, we do actually have one more hand. If okay. You can. All yeah, right. Sorry. Um, so our last commenter, this is for Katie. You should now be able to unmute yourself and you'll have two minutes. Thank you. I just wanted to um, add one further question to Alice's question, and it concerns affordable housing. I've tried to look through the county website a few times to identify what exactly the criteria is for affordable housing. And if I could be pointed in that direction, I would be very grateful. And I think it would be nice for all of us when we're looking at these proposals to truly understand what the county considers affordable housing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Katie. And any other public comments? I'll just give it one more moment to see if anyone wants to raise their hand. And Chair Dawson, I see no further hands, so I'll take the slide down. Um, uh, just a quick response to Larry. Um, we don't have a, a public uh, response to the approval of the minutes, and at least in my notes, but I'm happy to put that in uh, going forward. So there's an opportunity for the public to comment on that. Um, and is there, um, and just a question for Hannah and Ariel, is there any problem with making the change that Larry suggested since it was a, an error? Do we need to vote? Uh, no, no. Um, I, if you would just amend the, you know, uh, I, I think it's fine. Um, we will we'll have to go back and review the video to make that correction because I wasn't really following um, what he was describing. I was comparing it to the minutes, but, but we can make that change, no problem. Okay, great, thanks. All right, any um, council member uh, thoughts or responses um, to the public comments? Yes, council member Newhauser. You're on mute. Having been gone for a month, I'm a little bit uh, in the catch up mode, but um, I did review the minutes and I have questions, um, but I'll reserve many of those for the agenda item on this month. But it, regarding Larry's comment, I did see a reference to uh, Larry's comment about um, increasing funding for uh, fire services. So I, I, it's in there it may be just misplaced or um, misconstrued uh, um, elsewhere. Um, regarding uh, Alice's comments, um, yeah, I think it, it would be very helpful um, having um, more comprehensive numbers. It seems like ABAG is driving a lot of this process. I mean, the homeless crisis is an issue too, but the homeless crisis is not going to be um, resolved through housing unless there's a concerted effort to build subsidized housing, either from government or from nonprofits. Um, and I, it's, it's unfortunate that it's being driven by a bag, in my opinion, because it's really about numbers to meet expected growth. And most of the growth projections are inherently unsustainable. <laughs> 
And, it, and there's no consideration for carrying capacity of the land or available water or building into fire prone environments. Um, it's, it's insane that it's strictly based on expected growth. And so I think that looking at cumulative impacts to the environment and to the quality of life for not only people who live here, but also all other species that inhabit this planet. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Neuhauser, uh, other comments or responses? Uh, can, um, I, can I respond to Jay's um, comment just to clarify the admin? Yeah. So the videos are up on the Max website after the meeting. It usually takes anywhere between five days and a week to get them up after the fact. Um, and as far as the presentations, those also go up on the website for the previous meeting um, once that is updated. So um, I would expect the presentations to be up next week sometime. Uh, you can always reach out to Hannah or I um, and we can provide it to you. Um, we have to make them ADA compliant, so that's the lag time. But since that's not a concern with you, Jay, um, you can always reach out to us and we can provide it to you um, as soon as we have it. And we can try to send it to send out PowerPoints with the agenda, but since we send out the agenda two full weeks before the meeting, that might be asking a lot of presenters, including myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a night before kind of guy myself for those kind of things, but, but afterwards, you know, I always have something to give you afterwards, <laughs> if that works. Um, well, I just have a little response to um, Alice. I really like that idea of basically having a dashboard for housing and, and being able to look at you know, sort of how all this fits together. And I also had a, a comment um, or, a, or kind of a, a question for Susan, uh, if, she, if she wants to respond uh, during her update or, or another time. But um, I didn't make the community leaders meeting, but I, I was looking at the um, bullet points from that. And it was said that actually the population of um, District 1 is declining. So I was just wondering how that ties in with building more housing. Um, I'll, I'll do a report uh, during my report. I noted a couple of the questions. Okay, thanks. Um, so any other comments or responses to uh, public comment? All right, I think we can um, move on. And uh, Supervisor Gorin, uh, it's your opportunity to give us an update. Okay, let's see if this works. I'm so jealous of Jay's virtual photo. <laughs> Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you might see that I've already cut it up because I was <laughs> saving an article. So, <laughs> um, it, it, and at some point, I'll get my photo in the Kenwood Press of me sitting there, maybe my new house, who knows, reading the Kenwood Press because it's a Newspaper, with, um, and I want to thank um, Melissa and Paul for taking it on and Jay for his continuing reporting. Uh, he is always peppering me with questions, including today, and I'm saying, what guidelines, Jay? What are you talking about? So uh, I, I will answer his questions if I can figure out the context. Uh, but he did note um, quite accurately that we had a very long day yesterday, almost a 12-hour day. So I'm a little tired tonight and I probably won't stay with you for the full MAC meeting. Uh, but some of the issues that we talked about, including um, fire services, um, you should pay attention to uh, funding for fire services. Thank you, Damon. We worked with Damon Doss and uh, Darren Bellick to understand what they need for funding for sustainability in the short term knowing that they are going to go out for the voters in the fall for uh, to increase their parcel tax, to increase their sustainable funding. But all of the fire districts are going to have to jump on board and support the fire services tax measure sometime next year, probably in June, not sure when, and not sure what that looks like yet. Other than this has been a long time coming, we have had conversations, I think just about every year I've been on the board about the inadequacy of funding for fire services, especially as our districts are evolving from 
uh, almost purely volunteer like Kenwood had been to more of a professional basis um, with some paid um, fire chief, battalion chief, adequate staffing, adequate fire stations. And so uh, at that point, it will be important for you to have a presentation with Steve Aker and Mark Hine about how that is moving forward. It's been the direction of the board for a number of years to begin and support consolidation efforts. And Damon could tell you how many districts we have. It's, it's a lot. Uh, some really urban professional like Santa Rosa and Petaluma, some with paid uh, fire uh, folks and officers and others like Windsor and, and Shell Vista and others purely volunteer. The counties had a traditional role of operating CSA 40, which is the, which was, is still uh, the service provider and uh, the helper for the uh, primarily volunteer fire companies. And we want to get out of that business and they want us to get out of that business, but it means that we really need to work together to consolidate and to agree to terms um, on and agreements. And that is what we approved yesterday. And I, I can't tell you, it's in the millions of dollars that we cobbled together from a number of sources, including TOT, uh, that really uh, recognized the challenges of Kenwood. So we gave them some funding, I think about 180,000. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Damon. Uh, Bodega Bay, really struggling, the highest parcel tax in the county, maybe in the region, and still it's inadequate to meet the needs to respond to all of the visitors that managed to throw themselves off cliffs. Oh, I didn't mean that. Well, actually some of them do, but some of them drive off of cliffs accidentally. And there's a lot of uh, search and rescue and emergency response in Bodega Bay. But the needs are great also in the North County with a lot of uh, different fire districts and in the South County for sure. So that's the direction we're going. Uh, we've been working with the leadership group for fire services and the fire ad hoc committee, subcommittee um, of David Rabbit and Linda Hopkins uh, to work and, and negotiate with the fire uh, companies. It's not adequate for anybody's needs, but it's a step in the right direction. And at some point uh, you should invite Steve Aker and, and Damon to really talk about the needs of the district and the challenges of consolidation. Uh, Sonoma Valley worked hard uh, going through consolidation through LAFCO last year. Uh, they could not absorb Kenwood at that time because their salaries were so low. They couldn't afford to bring the salaries up to the average of the other salaries. So it's complicated, but I think it was a incredible step in the right direction. And again, thank you, Damon, for all of your work on the Kenwood Fire District, absolutely essential. Um, another issue that we approved without much comment was the beginning of a conversation regarding drones. Um, this was, boy, this is, um, you know, who knew we were going to have to talk about drones and established policies. Uh, we do have some challenges with amateur drone operators uh, wanting to get a bird's eye view of the fires. And it means that they ground aircraft. And so they, uh, we, we are going to be pretty specific about they're not allowed in fire zones. They're not allowed on the regional parks. They're not allowed anywhere close to an airport or an airway. And um, we know that commercial drone operators uh, do uh, earn a good bit of money shooting uh, footage of real estate and other uh, fun activities, but uh, we also need to take this seriously. Um, vacation rentals, we had a workshop. Uh, every year we have a discussion regarding vacation rentals. And there will be an opportunity for uh, community outreach in the Glen Ellen and Sonoma Valley area. I wanna pick your brains about the challenges that you see, what is wrong with the current ordinance, how should we fix it? And I encourage you to go on to the board agenda yesterday with the PowerPoint um, and the video presentation uh, um, 
Scott Orr and Brian O and um, uh, Gary Helfrich have been really working in the, in the absence of Jane Riley on um, making some really important modifications and suggestions moving forward. So you might want to have a, an update on that when it comes out to the community. Oh, what else? Oh, we approved a redistricting commission, which is what touches on housing and population growth. Um, there, I had um, two appointees, uh, primarily from Santa Rosa, Socorro Shields. Yes, I know she's conf uh, controversial, but she understands Santa Rosa and Sonoma Valley. Uh, someone from the League of Women Voters who understands um, uh, citizen participation and outreach, uh, because that will be important. And Veronica Vences from La Luz Center and uh, Vice Chair Ray, Ray, Mac Vice Chair Ray Willett, uh, going to be on the redistricting commission. It's going to be really telescoped in time. And you're going to want to pay attention to that because we will have folks doing an in-depth analysis about population growth and shrinkage in the various districts. So all of this is really important because they reorganize and realign the supervisorial districts based upon the information in the census to uh, 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 make approximately equal the number of folks in each of the supervisorial districts. As I said the last time, seat of the pants estimate is that Sonoma Valley has shrunk in population fires and and we have not grown except for the Fetters apartments they're really and Saha um, those few units we really haven't grown a few units here a few units there but compared to Santa Rosa, Roner Park, Windsor and now Petaluma they're just exploding with growth and so I do think it, it might be good to have someone from Sustainable Sonoma uh, invited to the MAC meeting to talk about housing because Caitlin and Kim and a lot of other um, uh, folks um, from the Sustainable Sonoma have really been focusing on the need for housing, especially in Sonoma Valley. And we know that we have a jobs housing imbalance and the number of jobs we have in Sonoma County uh, for the most part, our hospitality, agritourism, low wage jobs, and those folks cannot afford to live except in crowded conditions in the valley, or they're commuting from Lake County, Mendocino County, Solano County, and Santa Rosa. So the influx of jobs or workers coming into the valley is pretty intense. Um, I did have a meeting with uh, Caltrans and TPW regarding a number of areas along Highway 12. And uh, I really wanted to report back to you. We did have a, a, a good discussion regarding that intersection. And you'll be disappointed to know that, um, you know, and I, I think in out of respect for Caltrans, they have limited funds and probably a lot of desires uh, we all see the need to realign that intersection. They look at the accident data and they say it's not a problem. And except for Scott, Scott's horrific accident and maybe one or two others, sadly, they're looking at fatalities. And we don't have many, if any, at that intersection, but I'm not letting it drop. I'm just trying to figure out a way forward the reason why it's expensive to realign that intersection is because they look at turn lane lengths. And in order to create an adequate length turn lane, they're going to have to purchase right away from probably the land on the whatever direction that is the west side, which I believe might be owned by the Sonoma Land Trust, I think I read recently. And uh, so they will have to purchase land. There are some wetlands there perhaps and a uh, creeklet. So it is more complicated than just what we would like to say is just, oh, just repaint that intersection. It's fine. You got the road width. That's all we need is a passing lane. And yet they have vehicle standards and road standards that they have to abide by. So I'm trying to work with the county, work with Caltrans, and maybe work with the land trust on a less expensive solution for that intersection 
so that I can get a right hand turn lane there. But um, so hope springs eternal. And um, I, I think I told you, well, maybe I didn't the, uh, the last month, we, the board did approve a contract to redesign or design the bike lanes on Arnold Drive. There are half mile sections north and south of the roundabout that the shoulders are way too narrow for cyclists to ride safely, I believe. And it's going to be an expensive project, but we approved the contract and I am trying my darndest to get uh, that project and those lanes created in a timely way. It's just depressing how long it takes anything uh, to happen. And they said, oh, it'll be completed by 2025. And I said, no, it won't. I'm gonna be out of office then. It's going to be completed before then, right? So I'm working on it. <laughs> And that is my report. All right, thank you, Supervisor Gorin. Um, and now's an opportunity for uh, council member uh, responses, questions, um, comments. Yes, council member um, Das. I just want to thank the supervisor for her continued uh, pressure to keep things moving with the fire districts, consolidation discussions, and it's important that Kenwood uh, have equity with all of its partners that surround it, both Santa Rosa, the uh, Sonoma County Fire District and the Sonoma Valley Fire District. The issue really is, uh, as, as Supervisor noted, uh, salaries and staffing and having equity and equity costs money. And so that's the discussion. And I really appreciate uh, Supervisor staying on top of it for Kenwood, would appreciate it. Thank you, Damon. Thank you, Back Vice Chair. <laughs> Any other follow-up? Yeah, Council Member Das. I'd also like to, I'm on the board of the Housing Land Trust of Sonoma County. Mm -hmm. And I really would like for you folks to know more about them because we have 115 homes in Sonoma County that are for um, working, working folks. Um, they're not low income, but they're but uh, still working folks. And many of the people we focus on are school teachers and city workers, et cetera, hospital workers, et cetera. So I really would like for you guys to know more about that because most of our work, in fact, all of our work is on the 101 corridor. Uh, we've not really ever placed a home, built a home or taken over a home um, in Sonoma Valley or West County, but on the corridor, and I don't know if you know that it used to be that about 85 to 88% of all people in Sonoma County live within a five mile range of 101 either way, five miles on each side, which would take in all of Santa, most of Santa Rosa, most, all of Petaluma, all of Windsor. Uh, they're all close to that. And so that's where we've been doing it, but we sure would like to see some action over here in Sonoma Valley. And there are opportunities there and it's, uh, in, it's making affordable housing, not necessarily low income or, well, anyway, you'll hear from them. And, and so I, I have them on the queue to come in and talk about that in the future. Yeah, I look forward to that. Yeah, I would, I would love to hear that presentation. It's a good suggestion, Damon. I've met with Damon and Deb Goshis about the Housing Land Trust and it's a marvelous organization. The other person I hope you might invite in is former interim city manager, Dave Kiff, who is now the interim director of the Community Development Commission. Betsy Chavez is my appointee to the CD committee. And so you might want to have a conversation with both of them on housing, homelessness, funding, how the decisions are made. All right, thank you, Supervisor. Yeah, and housing is certainly squarely in our purview. So um, yes, Council Member Neuhauser. Oh, still, you're still uh, muted. Got it. I just wanna thank the Supervisor for addressing the issues of uh, the wage disparity and um, and the barrier that creates for affordable housing. Um, it, it's not gonna go away. Um, this is, a, you know, most people are in the service industry in our area, other than retirees and those of us who were able to get in a little bit earlier to get um, real estate before it 
overappreciated and became inaccessible to even those of us who, if we had to buy, tried today. Um, it would be impossible for most of us to get into this market. It, it's such a burden for people. Um, but I do think that there is a very strong correlation between um, the lack of affordable housing and the speculation that's going on, especially for vacation housing rentals. This is just a, uh, a real problem. Um, and I know that in our capitalist economy, it's really hard to say no, that if we don't have, I mean, it, I don't think we should have, our communities should have to rely on nonprofit organizations and basically publicly purchased housing to maintain affordability, which is basically what the housing land, the trust does. Um, I, I, I think we need, and this is gonna require a huge paradigm shift in, in how we view real estate. <laughs> and it's not something that can be addressed very comfortably in our you know, freewheeling capitalist economy that the speculative nature of real estate is just a huge problem. It's just, it just, I can't say enough about how much of a problem it is. And so I, I encourage us to push back against further expansion of this um, vacation rental um, economy. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And that's why I work so hard uh, to create vacation rental exclusion zones in Glen Ellen and Kenwood um, and in 10 different areas in District 1. I think I shocked the pants of my colleagues. Uh, they suggested that as a, as a way to move forward. And yet I had a good time with my magic marker on a map. So um, one of the discussion points will be is we have a moratorium of vacation rentals in the fire burn zone. At some point we need to lift that when we reach critical rebuilding. But uh, even before the fires in 2017, I was in discussion with neighborhoods like on Tree Haven Lane in Kenwood and uh, some areas around Glen Ellen. They wanted the exclusion zone to be expanded somewhat, not mm -hmm with all of the hills and the big houses on the hills. So you might have a discussion about where we think the boundaries should be to, if we're going to expand the exclusion zones or to cap the number of vacation rentals in district one or countywide. Uh, fruitful discussion, but there will be community outreach in Sonoma Valley. I encourage you to pay attention. Yeah. Maybe if I may just in um, yeah, exchange ahead. for one moment, um, it seems to me that there, there should be a decision making process, not just on where we think there should be exclusionary zones, but whether or not we should even have it in the first place. <laughs> and, it, and, and maybe the, the indicator could be the availability of rental housing because this is a, becoming a huge issue that, that rental housing is just not even available. I mean, you, I don't know if anybody's been following the news that the Ken Brown in, in the city of Sonoma, mm -hmm. I mean, they, they're having to do a GoFundMe just so a, a former city councilman can afford to you know, stay in his hometown. So it's, 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 it's gotten out of control. I mean, there's way too much speculation. Um, and, and it's not just for vacation housing, it's, it's for a whole you know, the whole corporate structure, the Wall Street gang that wants to buy up a bunch of real estate and control it. So it's, I don't know where you could draw the line, but maybe, maybe how rental availability could be used to curtail, a, you know, um, expansive uh, vacation rental. Just an idea, <laughs> thanks. I'll just throw in one. Thanks, Mark. I, I share those sentiments, and uh, maybe there's a way to, um, you know, make some kind of a regulation where if you're going to have a vacation rental, you also have to offer a, um, a long-term rental, you know, at an affordable price. I don't know. Just a thought to help balance it out. But that's that's a long discussion, I'm sure. 
Um, any other, other comments or responses to um, Supervisor Gorans or? Okay. All right, then I think we are ready. Um, is, is Scott Orr on deck, um, Hannah? Uh, do you wanna first open it to public comment? On... Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Um, yes, any public comments on, on uh, Supervisor Gorans update or the, the follow-up comments from the board or from the council? Um, so I'll give folks another chance to raise their hand if you're in the Zoom app or if you're a phone-in participant, you press star nine. And I see one hand at this time. Okay. And our first commenter, this is for Jay, you should now be allowed to unmute yourself and you'll have two minutes. Hi, uh, it's, uh, I'm back again. It's for Susan. Uh, a question you discussed in the fire services agreements. We've already talked about the CSA 40s at Tuesday's meeting uh, uh, quite a bit. Of, you did mention Kenwood, and the, I believe it was $180,000. Will there be future discussions of Kenwood at the Board of Supervisors levels? And uh, my question was if there was a 30 day period to um, get uh, agreements to, to move forward with, at least get it indications of intent to move forward is very important to to make this hundred eighty thousand dollars happen uh and it's going to be not a one-time shot but it's not a permanent fixture i don't think as i understood it so what, what's the nature status of kenwood and this 30-day agreement here um, uh, this uh, speaks to uh the point uh that i was trying to make is we're trying to encourage consolidation of as many fire districts as possible. And the some of the districts in the North County are, um, are, are really uh, not happy with the term sheet that the county worked out with them with the best of intentions and they wanna go back and revise that. But again, we have limited pot of funding. So uh, Bodega Bay is happy with their, I think they got a million dollars. Um, and, and I think that might be ongoing funding and the $180,000 that we uh, gave to uh, Kenwood, I believe is ongoing funding. Uh, and so uh, it is, it's cobbled together between one time and ongoing funding, to try to get to a place of stability for our districts. And so that was um, the discussion around, regarding CSA 40. And Jay, if you need any other questions answered on that, let me know and we can uh, have a private chat. Thank you, Supervisor. And thank you. Uh, any, anything else you wanted to say, Jay, before you you're, you had uh, about a minute, a little more than a minute left? Uh, Not seeing a hand, and I'm seeing okay. no further hands raised, Chair Dawson. All right. Well, thank you, Supervisor Gorin. And, um, and just on a more personal note, I hope you're back in your house, or if not yet, very, very soon. So close. I was <laughs> supposed to move in on Saturday, and the Yay. conference said, yeah. no, not ready. So ah. maybe the following Saturday. Ah. Anyway, I'm getting there. <laughs> yeah. The last part is the hardest, I'll tell you. Ah, so yeah. many details. Yikes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, congratulations on being almost, almost there. So now I'd like to welcome um, Scott Orr, who's the Deputy Director of Permits Sonoma, and he's going to give us an update on um, Permits Sonoma projects in the MAC area, and also uh, some uh, information on how to get uh, information, how to get information about projects and make uh, comments. Welcome, Scott. Yeah, well, first off, thank you so much for having me today. Um, it, it was I was happy that I signed on a little early to be able to listen to the public comment because I think I'm going to make. Uh, Alice, very happy, and I'm gonna, but I'm gonna disappoint Jay because um, I'm not gonna be doing a PowerPoint today, uh, since I'll be sharing my screen and doing a little bit more of a, a live walkthrough. So, um, uh, I've been talking with District One about uh, coming to this for a few months now. So, I apologize for the wait, but I'm hoping it's the first of a few times. Um, and like the supervisor, it was definitely a. Uh, working quite late last night. So forgive any fatigue as I sit in this hot room on this nice evening. So um, I thought what I would do is uh, share my screen and kind of show some of the resources that are on our website uh, for the sake of um, being able to uh, 
you know, from the comfort of your own home, take a look at, you know, you may see a construction site uh, somewhere, you know, while you're, you're going about your business and wonder, I wonder what's happening there. Or you may hear about a project and wonder, you know, uh, who's involved? Can I look at the plans? Things like that. Um, or just what's allowed on a piece of property. So I thought I would go through some of those. Um, I did see a Glen Ellen project uh, pop up relatively recently that I thought would be a good example. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about some things we're working on, which includes uh, um, kind of the next step of what I'm sharing today, which is really an interactive map that shows essentially every active project, every pl active planning project in the county with the ability to um, public, publicly comment on it right there. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. I haven't really told anyone about it yet, uh, but we're getting pretty close to finishing. So um, uh, apologies if anyone was hoping for a, a 30 minute PowerPoint, but um, I, I hope that this is at least uh, a little more uh, interactive. So uh, with your permission, Chair, I'd like to share my screen. Yeah, please go ahead. Great. And uh, uh, one other comment, uh, we had a member of the public who was asking about what is affordable in the county. Uh, that's actually done through the, the Community Development Commission and they break it down between extremely low, very low, low. Um, in terms of the planning department, we, can, we don't consider uh, median or moderate as affordable housing because quite frankly, it isn't anymore. So when we talk about affordable housing for a planning project, it's always um, below that moderate income level. So, so what I thought I would do is start at Google. And sorry, the Zoom interface is covering a little bit of my screen. So um, the, the best way to get to our website is just to Google Herman Snow. And then you will get a number of um, kind of sub options, but just for the sake of um, you know, the simplest possible thing, we're gonna go with the first link, which is just our website. And then this blue banner with the four icons is by far the most uh, useful and important component of our website, particularly these two things on the right, the permit history search and interactive maps. So we're gonna to go to the permit history search first, and then I'll bring up the example project uh, that I, I'm aware of. And again, I'm completely signed out of everything. So this is something that anybody can do. Um, it's, uh, it's a bit of a work in progress. It's not perfect. Uh, you wouldn't believe how long it takes to scan 50 years of paper, um, but, but we're getting pretty close. So the project that uh, heard about, and so you can search by address or parcel number, but I just happen to have a parcel number. So this project is at the Glen Ellen, Il Glen Ellen Inn site. Uh, I'm sure many of you are far more familiar with it than I am. But I think that makes it an even better example for me to go through since I, you know, I'm not, I'm not terribly familiar with, with this. And so what you'll get is a whole list of all permits ever applied for on the project, on the, on the property, um, with the most recent at the top. And so, you know, you may care about some of this old stuff, but for the most part, the most recent thing is probably what, uh, you know, drove you to wanting to take a look. So, uh, for the, the permit number is how we generally will refer to things. It's, uh, it doesn't really matter too much what the, the number says, just knowing that we, uh, the, the first number is the year. So a PLP 21 means it's a 2021 planning project. And it'll get a little more interesting after I click this. So on this page, it'll give you a description of the project, 
a kind of a general overview of where it is in the process. And um, if you want a little more information, you can also click on uh, the detailed timeline, which will tell you everything from um, the, the date they submitted, the date they paid for it, any notes in the system that the planner has already put in. And so, um, you know, I like to always, you know, remind my staff that, you know, the more we put in to this, the, the more informed the public is going to be and the better feedback we're going to get as we move through the process. So, um, you know, like here we have just some, you know, general comments between, you know, the planner and the, the applicant team that's working on the project. So, uh, one thing I thought I'd also mention is just the general process everything goes through. So uh, when an application is submitted, it's usually after a few discussions between um, a customer who's wanting to build something of some kind and the, the planning staff of the county. Um, just to, to make sure we do an initial check of, is this even possible under our code? And because we don't want to turn anyone away that, um, you know, it might be a difficult road, but there's definitely a path there. But we also don't want anyone to start, uh, you know, their dream project only to get to, you know, our door and realize, oh, I can't build a house uh, because it's in the middle of the Russian River and that's a floodway. So can't do that. Um, so we want to get, get those out of the way. So after somebody submits an application, we have 30 days to tell them every single thing that they're missing. And it's, it's very common to see a status of a project as incomplete because I, I'd say every single year that goes by, there's another requirement, whether it's federal, state, local, um, environmental, um, that uh, is needed for an fully analyzing a project. And uh, so th the way that it's set up at the county is we assign one planner uh, to each project. Um, it, depending on how long the planner has been with the county, they may have anywhere between 50 to 200 projects, which sounds crazy because it is a little crazy. Uh, they're not all always active at the same time, um, but uh, it's not, I don't get an opportunity to share that number very much. So what the project planner does is essentially shepherd it through the whole process. They are responsible for making sure that it meets all county code, um, all state requirements when there isn't a state permit. Uh, but the main thing that we spend most of our time on is environmental review. Um, and that's everything from you know, biology, water, uh, traffic, uh, aesthetics is something that we consider as part of environmental review also. And so that, that, um, that's the part that's the most challenging for us as staff because you know, we wanna sit down and get to writing and doing the analysis. But when we're sitting down and, and writing and doing analysis, that means we're not you know, talking to anyone because we're just sitting and writing. Um, so that's the part that I'm really pushing for us to do better about um, you know, just communicating, even if we're not even if it's just an update of, you know, today I worked on the biology section, it is much better than six months of nothing where everyone's wondering kind of what's happening. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of thoughts that can fill that space when it's quiet for six months. So this project, for example, um, uh, one thing I'd, I'd like to point out about it is there's also this documents tab near the top. And this will actually display every single scanned record that we have on this parcel. Um, uh, back until, can you see this, this old building record? I think a thumbs up from anybody? Great. So for example, you know, Ideally, we should have records all the way back until the 19 to the 1960s when building permits started. And uh, this this may seem a little dry, but it, it's honestly it's pretty fascinating going back and looking at um, you know. So this looks like it was a, a foundation from 1985. You know, just looking at the evolution of permitting from back then till now. Um, you know, you used to have 
you know, wineries approved in a two page document where now we're looking at, you know, 500 pages just because of CEQA evolving, you know, our understanding of cumulative impacts and all of that. So um, thank you for letting me nerd out on that a little bit. So going back to this record that's happening in Glen Ellen, it is at a point in the process that we call the referral stage. And the idea behind this is that it's very early in the process. And so we know what the project is, but we haven't had a chance to really dive into the analysis yet. Uh, so what we do is we do what's called an early neighborhood notification where we kind of send notices to property owners, usually within 300 feet, um, but sometimes we'll raise that up to a thousand. Um, you know, there's a lot of parcels, you know, like, uh, you know, out towards, um, you know, the, the southeast corner where the parcels start to get really big. So if we're looking at 300 feet, you know, that's going to give us like six neighbors. Whereas if we expand it to a thousand, you know, it might uh, triple that or more. And so the idea is to um, get members of the public fully engaged in the project as early as possible um, so that it isn't when you know, all of the analysis has been done where one neighbor says, I grew up next door. There's this like formation that I think could, you know, um, that, you know, may not have popped up on the biological report, but I think it might attract some kind of special species because it's serpentine rock or something like that. That's the type of thing we want to catch early, um, and including having all the discussions, you know, at the SVCAC and, um, uh, and you know, kind of other preliminary design review, things like that. We don't want to get too far down the road before people start you know, giving public comments and whatnot. So at the same time, we send it to other agencies such as Public Works, um, our grading and stormwater section, Sonoma County Environmental Health, because we're wanting the specialist to take a first look and say, oh yeah, this is definitely going to need a traffic study or, um, this seems fine, but I think they're going to need a you know food permit or something like that. So we try to get all of that information in the first thirty days, so that you know we're not in a you know place where you know kind of every two months we realize oh we need this oh we need that um, because that's not really um, you know while we may get to the same point it's not equitable to the people who are you know uh, very often you know this is their dream project that they're you know trying to see uh, happen. And you know, so it, it's, it's our goal to get through the process as fast as we can while doing the analysis that we need. So it's really best to kind of front load all of that, all of that content. Um, so I, I know that, you know, this is just, just one project, but I'm hoping that, you know, by talking today, um, you know, I, I very often will get, um, you know, emails from members of the public or you know, even the district one offices, you know, saying, oh, you know, what's going on with this project? And so being able to look at something like this, uh, you know, kind of helps, helps you get a sense of at least kind of where they are in the process, um, which is always a good starting point because it, you know, kind of sets the table for, you know, how, how urgent, um, you know, do, do we need an answer on this? And, you know, how, how much can we course correct to change things? So. Um, and at the moment, this parcel, oops, sorry, the, the burden of touch screen. So at the moment, this, this map, uh, isn't as interactive as I would like. So, uh, pulling off of my comment about uh, the speaker, Alice, who was wanting to see, you know, things in the pipeline, affordable housing projects. One thing we're we're getting really close on is like I mentioned, having all of our active permitting projects showing up as dots on a map, you know, sort of like if you're looking at, you know, Zillow or Craigslist or, or something like that. And, you know, and it, it adjusts to your map extent to, to see what's going on. And it would take you directly to the permit record that we actually use internally. Everything that we would have there would be shown uh, on what we're working on and including a, a button where you can click it to review all the documents and also to leave a comment right there in real time. So you don't have to, you know, figure out, oh, 
what's the planner's email address, you know, go over to a new window. It's, it'll just be right there. You can click it. And uh, one amazing thing is we've also made it so it'll automatically append to the record so that nothing can get lost. You know, right now there's still a bit of a, um, you know, transition, you know, someone may send a, a written letter and we have to scan it and then get that uh, to the project file for the commissioners to review later or Supervisor Gorin. Um, but this way, it'll just be a direct link between uh, public comments and the record. Um, so one other resource that I want to focus on um, very briefly, because I know you were hoping to end your meeting in two hours and I, I'm sure there will be some questions um, or comments that maybe this was a little boring. So I'm gonna Google Permit Sonoma again. I'm gonna click on the first thing again. And we're gonna to go to this interactive maps icon. So we have a number of different map types that um, are available. Luckily, uh, uh, you all don't have to worry about the California tiger salamander too much out in the Sonoma Valley. Um, but uh, we do have this map that'll tell you uh, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars of mitigation fees you need to pay uh, if you wanna do something uh, in the Santa Rosa Plain. But for now, we're gonna go to this zoning and land use map, which is um, an incredibly useful tool. Um, we use it internally even, and we're, we're continually trying to get uh, members of the public to actively use this and tell us what is missing, what can be better. So I'm hoping to get, a, get an email from Alice at some point if she's still here. So this map basically shows every single parcel in the entire county and what it's zoned. And even without getting into the, you know, the details of you know, what's allowed in each zone, um, there's a number of other things that we can take a look at. Um, you know, for example, you can look at where, you know, urban service areas are in the county. Not interesting to most, but really interesting to some. Um, you can see where the, the city limits are to, to block things off. Um, we've also, we've been working on pulling in riparian corridors, scenic resource areas, um, fire hazard severity zones, which is useful for, you know, when we're looking at analyzing a project, it's, it's impossible not to consider, uh, you know, all the aspects of wildfires at this point. So that's another thing we look at, and a, a lot of this is is pulling directly from what we use internally. So it's it's not um, it's not something different than what than what we're looking at. And then one thing that's also useful is just knowing that you can measure things on this page. You know, if you're ever wanting to say, you know, I wonder how big my neighbor's property is. You know, you could actually, you know, draw a little polygon and measure measure what it is. Um, or, you know, how far is it from my house to um, downtown Sonoma? So it, it's not just when you're working on a development project um, where you might want to look at this. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, you know, we could spend probably the next seven hours talking about individual projects and things like that. Um, but I really wanted to have this first discussion just kind of going over some of the, um, you know, some of the process, some of the things we think about and how we go about doing that. Um, just so that, you know, when you're talking about projects, you know, the, the community aspect, the health, safety, traffic, um, you can know that that's this is some of the steps we go go through and just kind of have that you know initial um, initial look just to be a little more dangerous that when when we talk again in the future um, and I, i'm sure one day you will all go back to meeting in person uh, i know that supervisor gorin is <laughs> as excited for as anyone to do that and I, i'd be happy to come back uh, when, whenever that happens and Maybe not, Scott. I actually like zooming from my home. It it saves greenhouse gases and it's really convenient. Oh, did I say that? 
we are we are meeting in person in the board chambers uh, and using a hybrid Zoom so people can comment either um, uh, physically and appear at the board chambers. It's very lonely because we allow, allow one person in at a time or via Zoom. So there you go. We're trying to normalize. Back to, back to wearing our masks. Ah. Yep. So uh, I'm, I'm going to stop there just because, um, again, I, I never know how interesting it really is to, you know, uh, you know non-planners, but I, you know, uh, hope it at least kind of sparks some questions and I'd be happy to, um, you know, talk about uh, whatever you want to throw my way. Scott, just want to say thank you. That was a really good presentation. I'm excited about the tools that you guys are developing and, and um, yeah, the direction you're going is exactly where I would want to, you know, what I would want to tap into as a member of the public um, to see what's, what's going on in my neighborhood. Really, that's, that's great that you have that vision. Um, so any, any comments from, uh, we'll take comments and questions from council members and then we'll move to uh, the same from the public. Um, council member Newhauser. Yeah, thank you, Scott, that was great. Um, it's, it's great to know I have looked at the, the mapping uh, program and it is uh, quite interesting. Uh, I think just in anticipating uh, some public questions, uh, I think it'd be really helpful to know what this uh, public comment process is, a little more specifics. Um, is it restricted to just certain types of permit activities, such as you know, certain types of uh, building improvements or new construction or remodel? Um, and, and is it limited to um, certain areas or certain zoning areas because I know that there's been issues where uh, new construction happens and there's no comment period and neighbors get upset because suddenly they, their whole house is shaded out by a, a new high rise construction project. <laughs> it, it can be rather disturbing. And um, so, yeah, if you could comment on that a little bit. Sure. Um, so in terms of I'm gonna go uh, reverse order to your questions in terms of areas and zoning. So I, I would say that um, the, the biggest difference in terms of area is we've got the, uh, you know, the county at large and then we have the coastal zone. The coastal zone kind of operates under its own rules, um, uh, which, which is a little different since uh, we are kind of acting on authority given to us by the California Coastal Commission. Um, so we're gonna set that aside for now. In terms of the, the rest of the county, which includes you know, all of Sonoma Valley, um, the the way um, the way our zoning code is broken down is here's all the things that you can do by right. Um, you don't need special permission to do it. Um, that doesn't mean there's not a permit. You know, if if it's a um, you know a residentially zoned parcel, you're going to build a residence. Uh, the state says yes. That's that's something that should go there and the process is a building permit. So uh, those are what's called ministerial permits where essentially if they meet all of the requirements, uh, they get their permit. The other part of our zoning code is what's called discretionary uses. So things like use permits, um, but it's also things like a changing of zoning or amending the general plan or um, uh, doing a subdivision. Those are the types of things that uh, under the state law are required to be this kind of open public process where the public has an opportunity to be heard, not only uh, commenting through the permitting process, but also um, in almost all situations of public hearing, at least one public hearing. And so those are the, uh, the ones where you're gonna hear most about. Um, that's not to say that the ministerial permits can't be commented on, but we have very uh, rigid uh, kind of limitations on what we can ask for and what we can require uh, because it's, it's essentially, you know, it gets longer every year, but it's essentially a checkbox um, where, you know, the state says, you know, this is what is safe and this is what is appropriate. So we're, we're going with that. Um, 
Uh, there are times where you know, we may be superseded and we've seen a lot of changes about accessory dwelling units, for example. Uh, they used to be called second dwelling units in the county and they have required a use permit. So it would be the, the same permit to uh, open a winery you would apply for to get a, a granny unit in your backyard. State law changed um, little by little and then a lot by a lot to where now it's, it's essentially just a building permit. And not only that, we only have 60 days from the day they pay for it to approve it. Um, so there are these, these outside forces that do affect um, you know, what, what we're able to do. Um, we're, we're actually a we've brought a updated accessory dwelling unit ordinance to the planning commission recently, and it'll be coming to the board in September. Um, the pass to the planning commission, I believe it was five zero, um, relatively minor, just bringing us in line with state law, but giving us a little more of that kind of local, uh, uh, local need um, because you know, a, a lot of the changes that come out of the state are really uh, city focused, whereas you know, the county is, has much more of a you know, rural character that you know, doesn't always come across in kind of sweeping uh, housing legislation. So um, I think I touched on at least maybe 90% of the question. I don't know if that's, if there's anything that I missed on. No, I, I, I get it. And I understand the difference between ministerial and, uh, discre and discretionary. Um, it doesn't mean that it's um, helpful to those residents who get surprised by inappropriate development um, next door. Um, I just, you know, and this is not on you, obviously, this is really more about uh, public policy and, and what should be available um, as in just better information for the community when these types of developments occur so that, that you know, people are at least aware of them before being rudely surprised, even if it is ministerial. And I don't know how to improve that information availability and that that's really maybe you know above all of our pay grade here you know but something that maybe susan uh, can uh, as she wanders away <laughs> can take a note about um yeah i see you there um but you know it is an issue and and i know that you know and unfortunately then you get complaints and then you get lawsuits and if it was addressed upfront and proactively through some kind of a public process, then you could avoid all of the ugliness that follows when, when people get these, you know, kind of rude surprises. So that's just a comment. And I just wanted to comment. I, I understand exactly what you're saying because many people, especially uh, folks living on the Hill Road of outreach to us and yeah. are really frustrated by not only that house, but other houses, a small house that are suddenly expanded twice their size with mm -hmm. accessory dwelling units and pools and pool houses and the outdoor barbecue areas. And it, it, um, it, it, it's an affront to the modest kind of community that existed in areas of Glen Ellen to have this ginormous house wedged into the, um, into the lot. Now, what Scott didn't say is they're not finished reviewing that particular house plan. I thought maybe they were, but apparently not. So, um, Scott, you might ask, does it make a difference in your project review if you have folks from the neighborhood or from a community write to you expressing some concern about the size of a of a house uh, that is being expanded on a particular lot. How do you deal with that? I think that uh, particularly for ones that do have um, design review, I, I think that elements like that uh, are useful because even though, um, so for example, um, most single family, do family dwellings um, go through a, what's called an administrative design review process where we're not, um, we're not debating on whether or not they're allowed to build a house. Uh, we're just making sure that it looks like something that's consistent with what was established in a general plan and local, 
you know, area and specific plans of this is what is appropriate in our community. So comments on those, um, I would say are particularly helpful because it, um, you know, it's, even though we're not debating on whether or not they can have a house, uh, we still are able to, you know, uh, kind of guide uh, landscaping suggestion or landscaping requirements, um, possibly shifting angles, because um, like the example you mentioned of, you know, something towering above a neighboring property or you know, daylighting it, um, that is definitely something that we want to avoid and setbacks aren't always going to be able to do that. Um, so ho however much we can, um, you know, we, we will take that into consideration. Um, one thought I had uh, as you were speaking of, um, you know, the information being so important early in the process, um, the, the tool that I'm, I'm, that we're working on uh, getting, you know, I think one thing that'd be great for that is, you know, some ability to kind of flag um, parcels as I'm interested in, in anything that might happen with this parcel. You know, so let's say you've got a, a vacant lot next door. Um, you know, I, I want it to be at a point where you can say, I am interested in anything that's applied for in this parcel and then getting an automatic email, you know, should something be submitted. Um, it's, it's hard to get, um, uh, it's hard for us to kind of share anything before submittal because very often we don't even know about it. Um, and it, it's very often that it coincides with the change in ownership. Um, so it, it's, it's very hard to predict what people will do. Um, but that, that initial submittal is, is probably the best, um, the best time to say, hey, um, I at least need to start paying attention with what's happening here because um, it looks like they're getting, they're getting started on something. So I, I know it's probably not the, um, the best solution or the silver bullet, but it's um, probably something that's at least uh, feasible for us to implement in the relatively near future. Scott, I've, uh, I'm going to speak and, in and, a and Arthur, I'm going to have to say goodbye to all of you. I'm fading fast, dropping my head down on my desk. Um, and I'm sure Scott is as well. Thank you, Scott, for the information. Really appreciate it. And if the MAC members still have some questions, but please be gentle. Uh, he was up late last night, too. So <laughs> thanks, everybody. If you have any other questions for me, let, uh, let uh, Hannah know and then we'll talk about it and send you the information. Thanks so much. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Scott, if I could just jump in quickly with, because uh, I have that situation, I have a, you know, I live in a rebuild, a fire rebuild, there's an empty lot next door. I'm not sure what's gonna happen there. Um, so what, are you saying I can uh, sort of contact you guys ahead of time and say, if this comes up, please let me know, or, uh, or do I have it's, to watch? Uh, it's Right now, it's something that uh, doesn't e exist yet, but is something that I'm actively exploring. Um, you know, it's it's the type of thing where it's it's soon enough that I'm comfortable mentioning that I'm working on it, but um, as opposed to you know something that's so far down the road that I wouldn't even want to like you know give hope. But it, it's something that I'm actively working on because um, you know so much. You know, even just, you know, the SQL process is primarily designed as informational, you know, even before the environmental component, it's just making sure the public knows things. And so, you know, really trying to incorporate that in everything we're doing. Um, I mean, that's, you know, part of the reason I and so many of the other people in my department got into public service is to, you know, bring people into the process uh, that, you know, seems just like a, you know, behemoth doing its own thing. So, um, it, it doesn't mean we'll be able to do everything overnight just because you know we're we're managing resources, but you know I do want to get to a place where essentially at any given time anyone can look at whatever is happening in any parcel in the county. All right, thanks. Um, other questions by um, from council members? Yeah, council member Dickey. Thanks, Scott. Very very informative. Very informative, uh, and I, I have to commend you for the, the progressive nature of the information uh, structure. Very well done. Um, I have a question about the overlays themselves. I'm wondering if there's one for um, vacation rentals. 
One moment. So uh, yes, but opposite. So there's a layer for the exclusion areas. So uh, if you turn that on, it's pretty much everything else um, besides you know, R1 zoning or, or certain zonings that don't allow it. Um, that is that you, know, you mentioning that uh, makes me believe we should probably create um, a viewer as we go through the vacation rental ordinance update process, just to kind of give a, a quick snapshot of, you don't even have to think about zoning. This is just where it's allowed in the county. So I'm gonna, um, gonna make a note of that and uh, apologies for having to disappoint you today with not saying, yes, I have that. No. So follow-up question. Um, as you do that going forward, do you think individual properties will be identified as vacation rentals themselves? Or is that too intrusive into the privacy of home, home ownership? Um, it's hard to say. Um, I don't know if you happened to catch the, the meeting at the Board of Supervisors yesterday. Uh, one thing that staff is recommending right now is really shifting it from you know, a land use permit into a business license because it really functions, you know, more of, more as a business than a residential use. Um, and we're, we're hoping that by potentially going down that road, it'll also lead to stronger enforcement um, so that when we do have, you know, bad operators, we can more swiftly um, kind of rectify the situation where, uh, you know, earlier I mentioned, um, you know, how accessory dwelling units used to be the same permit type as a winery, um, you know, vacation rental permits being a planning permit, we have a very strict due process requirement where um, even if there is, you know, something that happens that, you know, is um, egregious, you know, we still have to go through the, the whole process of, you know, verifying it, potentially coming back and having a public hearing if it's egregious enough that we're recommending revocation. And, all of this is, um, it's, it's not fast. It takes a long time. And uh, time is, is the, last, the last thing anyone wants to be spending on, you know, what is clearly a problem. So um, I, again, probably not a great answer, but um, it's, it's, it's a comment that we'll wanna hear as we look to have uh, future workshops on the vacation rental ordinance. Uh, like Super Supervisor Gordon said, uh, there's been many so far and there's gonna be many to come, uh, but we're hoping that this next round of updates can really address some of the more glaring, um, glaring issues and just make it easier to do the right thing. Yeah, you know, I mean, just as an aside to that question, um, it's notable that the Sonoma Valley has a larger percentage per capita of vacation rentals and wineries. And, um, you know, maybe it's not necessary countywide to have that information available, but I do think it is for our area because of the prevalence of, of you know, vacation rentals and wineries. And honestly, if you're a real, if you were going to buy a piece of property, wouldn't you want to know that that's the case with one of your neighbors or potential neighbors? I mean, all of this information becoming transparent, I think, is an advantage across the spectrum of these sorts of intersecting business interests. Yeah, and that that's one of my goals of you know making. Well, we're already at a point where you know almost every permit record. Um, is, is getting scanned into to each parcel. And vacation rentals are one of those permit records. You know, there, there's nothing confidential um, about someone having a vacation rental permit. So, um, I mean, uh, I, I live in Santa Rosa. I thought, hey, I wonder if my neighbor is, is having a vacation rental because I always feel like there's someone different. So I went on their website and I looked at their permits and uh, turns out they're just students, but <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's, it's impossible not to be curious. And so I just, 
um, you know, my mission is to, you know, lean into all of your curiosity and make sure that you can look at, you know, whatever you want to look at. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, Councilmember Eagles, did you have a question? Yeah, and I'm conscious of your time and fatigue, Scott. Really cool. Thank you for nerding out on us and going through that. So my, this might be a naive question, and I'll be the first to admit that. It might be an apples to oranges question, but kind of to what I think Alice was asking earlier, you, you showed us a really granular, wonderful, you know, detailed look into individual processes. But what is the process for understanding how all the things going on now sort of aggregate toward the general plan housing and and um, other requirements. Is there a mechanism that, that that website kind of assists with or is that a completely separate mechanism that sort of tallies and assesses against goals? Yeah, I, I would say right now it's it's separate. Um, I, I believe it might've been, um, I know earlier ABAG and MTC was mentioned. They're the ones who kind of come out with you know, regional housing needs assessment and that's kind of what the state uses to decide uh, if we're going to get money um, for certain certain programs. If we're not meeting our affordable housing requirements, uh, we suddenly get less funding. Um, so one thing that will be happening in the next couple of years is, um, and I think, um, I hope I'm not misspeaking, but I think we need to finish by the end of 2023. Uh, we need to be updating uh, the general plans housing element. And a lot of the things that um, have you know, come up today and uh, are um, not only the things that I can't answer, but the things I touched upon are going to be expanded. And um, the, we're at a point where, with this housing update where you know, we have much better you know, GIS resources and, and technology than we did for the last one, um, including um, you know, kind of more of a conscious effort to have a functional, friendly website. So I, I think this cycle, you're going to see a lot more, um, I'm hesitant to say story map, but much more of a kind of a narrative experience of like, this is what we're being required to do. This is what we think we can feasibly meet with the current, um, kind of the current setting. And then these are some things that might be necessary to, you know, foster, greater levels of affordability or, you know, possible code changes to, you know, kind of incentivize, um, you know, creation of uh, housing for the missing middle, you know, people that, you know, don't qualify for any of the, the lowest level uh, assistance, but can't hope to live in Sonoma County because, you know, they're not, um, you know, making a San Francisco wage, for example, yeah. um, you know, and, and even at the county, we feel this, um, you know, trying to attract, you know, people, you know, talented people who want to, you know, start a life, you know, be a planner, be a environmental scientist, and then they take a look at the, the housing prices here and, you know, suddenly Fresno, Fresno looks a whole lot more inviting. So <laughs> it's, it's um, you know, even, even on the, you know, the professional side, we're, we're feeling that crunch that was mentioned earlier. So I know I meandered a little bit, but um, uh, the, the takeaway is a, is a commitment to making more available and showing kind of the process of this is what's required, this is how we think we're going to get there, and this is what we might need to change in order to truly get there. Thanks, Scott. Okay, and uh, Council Member uh, Nardar Morgan? Thank you, Arthur. I just want to say um, great presentation, Scott. And I actually want to thank you personally, because I'm pretty sure that you were the person that helped to resolve an issue in our neighborhood that had been going on for close to two years. Um, we had a landowner who was trying to shore up the creek in a very destructive manner, uh, not only destructive to the creek, but divisive to our neighbors. Uh, we had tried so many avenues to stop this. I mean, everything from rebar to bricks to plastic was going into that creek. Um, and finally, when we got to you, you were able to step in. He was doing all of this without permits and you were able to step in and help us resolve that. And I wanna thank you so much. <laughs> well, I, um, thank you. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not great at getting uh, appreciation or positive comments. So 
Um, <laughs> if if I turn red, it's partly the red hair and partly just because I'm not good at um, positive feedback. So, but but truly, thank you. Yeah, we live on Warm Springs, so you know you're going to be familiar with it, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And other comments from council members? Yeah, council member Newhauser. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up real quick on what Kate was asking about and also Alice. I mean, I, I think that what we're really hoping is that sometime in the future, we we're able to view that information about um, how much affordable housing it is, whether they show up as dots on a map or if it's in a written narrative in the housing element. But it, you know, it, it, it would be a shame to have to wait till a housing element is published, you know, and they have it only be updated every 10 years. So it, if there was something that was uh, active, such as in your, um, uh, the, the interactive uh, database and or maps, um, it's just something to aspire to. Um, and, and I understand that, that the ABAG requirements, um, you know, are kind of a, a moving target, but I think that they're for a certain period of time so we should be able to know and know how we're moving forward and achieving those goals. Um, I'm not convinced it's the greatest thing based on my previous comment that I don't know if we should be chasing the ABAG numbers just for a lot of other reasons. Um, but, um, but maybe you could clarify one thing though, is, is are, are the um, uh, objectives that we're pursuing here, are they based on a um, kind of a, a, a lumping of um, uh, of requirements for the whole county, or is it actually broken down by district and or um, sub area within a district in achieving those, those um, housing objectives? Yeah. Well, it, it really all stems from what's in our general plan. Um, and there are portions of the general plan that are broke, broken up to, to regions, you know, Sonoma Valley, um, Petaluma Dairy Belt, you know, things like that, where, you know, might get a little more specific. Um, most of our housing goals are countywide. Um, and, uh, you know, just because it's, it's really hard in a document like the general plan to say, uh, you know, this part of the area uh, doesn't need to prioritize housing, you know, and, and this part of the, the county, um, you know, you didn't do so good last time, so you really need to do better this time. Um, so it, it's 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 hard. I mean, there are. I mean, just speaking, you know, candidly, there you know there are parts of the county and there are cities in the county that you know uh, you know weren't as successful at meet during this last arena cycle. But we're also in a weird uh, time at the moment because uh, Sonoma County has actually done extremely well from. Uh, a housing creation standpoint um, for our uh, jurisdictional size. And, you know, there's a number of, you know, bills that have kicked in over the last few years. We actually, um, they didn't affect us because, you know, we had uh, been so far ahead of, you know, kind of what the last cycle required of us. But now we're in this weird point where, you know, uh, we're going into this new cycle and new homes being, you know, new housing projects built now don't give us any credit for the next cycle, you know, even though it's just an arbitrary date. Um, you know, if I was to, you know, have a, you know, 50 unit apartment complex built right now, it's not going to do me any good for, you know, that next housing cycle. Um, so it's, it's incredibly complex. We're still kind of navigating along with, you know, all the other counties and cities in, in the state on how exactly we're going to um, proceed with all. Um, I don't think I'd want to deviate too much more from that just because it's, it's so complex. I don't think I, I have a very um, uh, useful answer. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Um, just to check in here, we're at an hour and 45 minutes. Um, we will take uh, time for public uh, comments uh, right now, but just, just a heads up. We'll, we'll um, check in after public comments about uh, See how things are going for the rest of the meeting. Um, Hannah, any anyone in the public who wishes to uh, comment or ask any questions? I'm seeing three hands so far, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. Just one moment. All 
All right, and for our first commenter, this is Larry. You should now be able to unmute and you'll have two minutes. Okay, uh, thanks, Scott. I wanted to know if you uh, can direct me to who can talk about the next level up in terms of not piecemeal uh, activities with regard to parcel, but the cumulative effect of the different general plan and specific plans and SDC specific plans and uh, changes in the regional plan for Sonoma Mountain and the water uh, debates that we're having in the valley. That is, I've been chasing around for some time to look for who and how are we at the valley to get a handle on the cumulative effects of all these different plans that are being put forward as frameworks within which decisions are made, whether people can or cannot do X, Y, or Z, but the communication between the planners with regard to all these planners doesn't seem to be clear to me. And I don't see how the public could get a handle on all these different, you know, you can look at the general plan and say, well, that's great, but the state's telling us to do this and uh, upgrade the general plan. And you can look at the specific plan for SDC, but it doesn't tell you much about what the impact of that is gonna be on Glen Ellen. And meanwhile, Glen Ellen wants to do its own specific plan. And all those things are at a more abstract, perhaps, or general level than the kinds of things that you're doing, developing the database, which is necessary, because we're not gonna be able to know what happens unless your program of getting the actual parcel information available, then the public can't do anything. But if we get that part done, which looks like it's moving ahead with the GIS and so forth, how do we start moving from a piecemeal approach to a, a, a and I don't mean piecemeal by parcel, but I mean a plan here, plan there, plan everywhere, and none of them connected it, to a comprehensive plan that says, hey, we wanna be a rural community, and this is the way we wanna design it, and this will fit the rules that kind of thing, where the public starts taking a more proactive role instead Larry, I think of your defensive two, role. Two minutes are up. Planning I think, department. I think I think we got the, your question. Thanks, Larry. Um, Scott, we could either um, go through all the public comments and have you sort of answer in in mass, or we could have you respond right now, whichever you prefer. I, I, I'm happy to go along with whatever the chair would like. Um, let, let's hear the other public comments, and then we'll we'll go back and and get all get your answers, and they, they may overlap some, so it may be a um, may save a little time there. All right, Hannah, next uh, public comment. Yes, our next uh, commenter, this is for Katie. You should now be able to unmute and you'll have two minutes. Hi, Scott, this is Katie Christ. Um, you have received correspondence from me about a property on Hill Road. Um, and I'm, I'm not wanting to talk about that today, <laughs> but thank you so much for your presentation tonight. And it's really encouraging. Um, to know about all of the automation of the information because that will just be so much so much easier for us to um, sort of track things down. But um, as it stands now, ministerial projects in Glen Ellen um, that fall outside of that small area that's um, mandated by the Glen Ellen Design and Development Guidelines for design review don't require any notification to the public in the form of the early neighborhood notification that you talked about which means that in order for us to stay aware of what's happening in our immediate area with regard to new construction, the onus is on each individual property owner to surveil all of the parcels in our immediate area. Um, and with all of the property turnover in Glen Ellen, it's really a lot to keep track of. Plus, um, more challenging is the um, ability how one could possibly um, keep track of permits that are being applied for by existing long-term property owners. Um, and I would argue that even for ministerial projects, um, just as with discretionary projects, having we have information that's helpful to the county in evaluating applications. Um, for example, drainage issues, narrow streets, fragile creeks, um, that the county staff may not be aware, aware of. Right now, it's my understanding that Santa Rosa properties um, are located within 300 feet of a proposed ministerial project are, in, are informed of the project. Is there any 
reason that with all the technological advancements, this couldn't be expanded to other parts of the county. Thank you, Katie. And uh, we'll, we'll have uh, uh, Scott will get a chance to answer that in a minute. And then our third uh, public comment. Yes, and we've had a fourth raise their hand as well, but for okay. our next public commenter, this is for Alice and you should be able to unmute and you have two minutes. Yes, thank you. And, and thank you, Scott. I, I appreciate that you're, uh, you're going on an empty gas tank. And I, uh, I certainly appreciate the complexity of what you have to deal with. And I'm very thankful for these new tools that you have highlighted. Um, but following on what Larry was saying and what Mark pointed out at the very beginning is just like, gee whiz, none of this stuff is really all that sustainable when we're shooting for all the, you know, these ABAG numbers. Why are we chasing these numbers? And it just, I keep coming back to this feeling that there's the, there's the, you know, permit Sonoma um, and it, it's all revolving in its own universe with these rules and that rules and these goals and that goal and, and all of that. And then there's this other universe of, wow, there's, there's droughts, there's floods, there's evacuation zones, there's fires, there's all of this reality spinning over here in this other universe. And it just kind of seems like these two universes aren't really intersecting all that. I don't have a lot of faith that these universes are really talking to each other and hearing each other. And that is very scary in this day and age as we're coming into, you know, looking at these alternatives for the SDC. And I just, yeah, I don't know how, how do we get to a, a place of feeling confident that the bigger picture is, is, is really being sought after and gone for as opposed to the, the piecemeal, let's just take care of this right now while we can. That's my fear. And that's, that's really what keeps me up in the middle of the night. So. Thank you, Alice. <laughs> And uh, another, I think we have one more comment, if there possibly yes. more. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, one more commenter. This is for Deborah. <clears throat> Got something in my throat. Um, you should now be able to unmute, and you'll have two minutes. And okay. Deborah, have you been able to unmute? Deborah, we're not hearing you. Um, let me go ahead and try that once more. One moment. And Deborah, you should now be able to unmute. Um, so for this commenter, we're not hearing you, um, but you're welcome to email your comment to um, me. My email address is on the front page of the agenda, and um, I will distribute that, that to the full council. All right. Sorry, Deborah, we couldn't, couldn't get through to you. Um, so, um, so Scott, if you want to answer, I'll, I'm just going to do a very quick recap. Um, Larry was asking about, uh, you know, looking at the cumulative effects and how does, how does that get taken into account? Um, how can we deal with that? Um, very similar to what Alice was saying about sort of the, the disaster world versus the increasing numbers of, of housing uh, that's, that's going on. And then um, and Katie was a little more uh, local, but asking how to, um, you know, if like a 300 foot zone could be incorporated in unincorporated areas uh, for notification of landowners. Um, and if I miss something, just, you know, jump in with whatever. Whatever you um, yeah, so I'll, I'll do my best to, to hit on those. So in terms of cumulative impacts, um, really the, so projects like uh, STC or the spring specific plan, uh, you know, as part of that environmental impact um, review process, they, they do need to be looking at cumulative impacts and they do need to be looking at projects that, um, it's not just projects that have already happened, it's projects that are happening. Um, so 
you know, as those two specific plans proceed, they will need to, you know, acknowledge that the other exists. Really the best time to have that um, analysis of cumulative impacts is during the general plan update. So, you know, I, I know it's one of those, um, it, it's getting to be one of those, those words that we all know it's going to happen eventually, but it's, it's never quite soon enough. Uh, we, we really hope to begin that in earnest next year. And that process, you know, so many of the issues that we talk about, um, that's the time. That's the time to really talk about. These are the things that, you know, we as a county say, yeah, this is allowed by right. And these are the things that we need to look at more. And these are the things that we want to promote and support. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm as eager uh, as anyone to get started on that, um, you know, kind of uh, in response to Alice's comment about, you know, we're so focused on, you know, the, the right now that we're not doing the bigger picture. Um, I, I acknowledge that the things that happen, happen day to day do take a lot of time. Um, and I, I guarantee you that, you know, having a, a, a public meeting talking about a general plan update is so much more interesting than uh, you know fence violations. Um, you know, no one went to, no one you know got a degree in environmental studies to spend you know 15 hours working on a staff report for a six foot tall fence. You know, that's just, it's not what you know drives people into you know public service. Um, in terms of disaster, um, I, I think probably our development community knows this a little little better than the public at large, but whenever there is an emergency in the county, uh, it's actually uh, my section that staffs a lot of the EOC, um, so, which means we're not able to uh, work on you know, our long range plans. Even our long range plans that are designed to make us more resilient in the face of disasters. So, you know, it's very much dealing with the, um, you know, emergency at our hands rather than, you know, trying to, um, you know, prepare for the next one. Uh, but the, the timing um, of that comment is uh, coincidental. So I actually missed a, uh, uh, a meeting on the Sonoma County Multi-Jurisdictional Hazard Mitigation Plan. Um, terribly long name, but a really important document that uh, should just be hitting the streets and should be uh, coming around to the board in, er I believe in December, it's on the significant item calendar. And so one thing that does is it's just kind of the next evolution of our uh, countywide disaster planning, working with all of our partners. And it's also an incredibly important tool for us to get um, uh, reimbursement from the federal government when things happen. Um, you know, we are one of, if not the only net loss uh, flood damage county. So uh, there's, it, it's, fires are the most recent, but we do have a lot of other disasters that need to be considered. Um, so I, I know that, just looking at my notes, um, one comment I'd say about the, um, you know, Santa Rosa doing uh, 300 feet. Um, for us, for, for me right now, it's really about balancing resources. Um, 1,700 square miles is just kind of a, a, at a magnitude that's uh, so much greater than you know a, a small city that it does make it more challenging. You know when we uh, notice projects, you know if we have a project out in Annapolis, you know that's someone who has to basically take an entire day to drive out there and do stuff. So um, I, I am looking at more opportunities that will uh, make it easier for us to do noticing. Um, you know, working with with landowners to you know, we we when we do noticing, we we fill out affidavits saying you know, you know, we are swearing that you know we have done this, and so you know, there's probably opportunities to you know work with landowners and have them help us do that, so we can make sure that it's done, but also um, that lets us use resources on you know maybe expanding notices in other places. Um, so um, I'd say it's okay to keep being a squeaky wheel on that. Um, uh, you know, you bringing up issues, you know, helps uh, push us to be better and keeps us honest. So um, even if I can't solve every issue right away, um, it's, you know, something we can work towards, you know, over the, the, the long term. I'm not going anywhere. So you can harp on me for a long time. Thank you, Scott. We really appreciate all your public service and, um, you know, uh, your heart's in the right place and, and uh, it's a big I, job. So 
I, I'm truly appreciating Mr. Dickey's response to, to that comment of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, sorry for uh, probably going a little longer than you thought, but I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come today and I look forward to coming back again in the future if you'll have me. All right, well, thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Scott. Take care. So um, I see we're right at two hours. Um, I'm, I'm gonna propose something and uh, Ariel or Hannah can tell me if this is outside of regular procedure, I can't remember, but I'd, I'd like to um, propose that we go ahead and, and do the um, item number six, the MAC funding overview and letters of support, because I feel like that's, that's an important piece that we've already put off for a month. And then um, basically skip number seven, unless someone from the ad hoc has a, a really important announcement to make, uh, we can push that into next month. Um, and hopefully that will get us out of here within the next probably 30 minutes. Um, does anybody object to that plan? Okay, so there are people are in favor of doing that. Um, all right, then, um, Ariel, looks like you're on for the funding overview and letters of support. Okay, and I'm going to ask uh, Hannah, make sure that Hannah can take minutes for this because our minute taker never showed up. So I've been feverishly typing this whole time. So um, I'm a little off my game of usually prepping before I do a presentation. I've been feverishly writing down things that Scott's saying. So my apologies if it's a little loose. You'll do fine, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm happy to take over the feverish typing. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, one second. Oh, and share screen. So I'm gonna, so the, I had prepared this and the first few slides are kind of review from last time. So in the entrance of time, I'm gonna kind of skip through them um, pretty quickly. But um, if anyone wasn't here or, um, you know, has any questions when we get to the end, you, I, I can go back, I can pull up the slides again if it's, a, um, if it's an issue. So um, this is reviews from my previous presentations. Um, it is just the overview of how the MACs are funded. So essentially they're funded through Measure L, which is a voter approved measure from 2016 that raised the transit occupancy tax or the hotel tax from 9% to 12%. 10% um, of that increase, so 10% of that 3%, 10% uh, of the 3% of the increase from 9 to 12%, um, goes into tourism impact funds, which is where the MAC funding comes from. Um, these are allocated proportionally to each district. So um, West County with the amount of tourism that's there, they get the most, we get the second most followed by Healdsburg and then uh, second district, which is South County and third district, which is Santa Rosa are kind of, neither of them get very much. Um, so, this is just kind of a visual representation of that. So um, there was uh, there were other things in Measure L. So um, that three percent of that increase, um, forty percent of that three percent goes to fire, twenty to road repair, affordable housing, etc. Um, so how can they be used? So um, the reason that we're able to fund the max through it um, is because it's outlined in the uh, in the policy of the way that the tourism impact funds can be used by our district. Um, there's also some other good stuff in there, public safety, parking enforcement, et cetera. Um, how did we use them these last fiscal years? So we have the parking enforcement in the springs. Um, Mateo doesn't directly benefit uh, you folks, but um, it is very expensive. Um, we also gave some funds to the Sonoma Valley School District to do some gardens. Um, we funded the uh, Charla Comunitaria that our colleague um, Karina runs, which is a Spanish language only information sharing. Um, we also give some funds to Food for All, which is a local sprung up during the pandemic, um, you know, food aid organization that I think many of you are familiar with. And then we also um, gave KSBY some funds for their new antenna that is going to improve their emergency broadcasting. 
Um, so the North Sonoma Valley Back funding, um, you know, we've talked about this, but there's a specific process. Um, it takes time. You know, we had Scott here talking about how long it takes permits to go through. And I apologize, there's a helicopter landing at the hospital by my house, if you can hear that. But um, it takes some time, um, but we have $10,000 for fiscal year um, that's used for ongoing expenses, as well as special projects when they're approved by, you know, it has to be approved by Supervisor Gorin since we bring it forward, but also by a vote of the MAC. Um, you all did that a uh, couple in, in May, I believe. So um, in this past fiscal year that just ended, that ended in June, um, we had 1950 in ongoing expenses. We started a little late and there was a couple of months that we didn't have the expenses. Um, and we allocated 4,500 for the preparedness ad hoc, as well as um, 300 for the outreach ad hoc for the refreshments for the neighbor fest. Um, briefly, the estimates. So we, we're doing this at the beginning of a new fiscal year, which is, is fairly elegant. Um, so um, our average minute taker expense is 250 per hour, which is an average of 3,000. Although you get you you get this one free because I don't get paid to take minutes and neither does Hannah, so um, saved a little bit of money there. Um, but I just want to flag this um, pot potential additional expenses interpretation. This is something that the Springs Mac does at every meeting. Um, we haven't had a request for it, nor have I seen a need for it yet. But um, were we to do that and were there to be a need, I know at the neighbor fest. Um, there was a lot of interest in reaching out to the, the, the Latinx community, the residents. So, I mean, that's great. And that's exactly what we want. And so if we get there, that'll be another expense. Um, so that would mean the remainder for, you know, this coming fiscal year um, would be 7,000 without interpreting estimate. And with it, it would be 4,000. So that's just a, a whirlwind tour through the funding and how it works. Um, oh, there's one more, the form. So we're familiar with the form um, and we are familiar with the idea of partnering with organizations and we can discuss that more. Um, the one thing that we are, and this is for the Springs Mac too, um, you know, we, we did it in the May meeting, but we would really like for um, novel requests that aren't ongoing expenses. Uh, the last month we should consider those as a, as a Mac is April just because of the time it takes to get these items through the board. Um, and I mean, this is kind of a reminder, but um, you know, because you are a government agency, you would need, or a subset of the government, you would need to partner with an agency if they were gonna directly receive funds. Um, I know that uh, the preparedness ad hoc did put in a, a grant um, request. I'm not sure if that's been, they've heard back yet, but there was a partner in that so that the partner would be receiving the funds, not, not the MAC, um, but you can work with the partner. So um, this was really the meat of what I wanted to talk about. So um, this is just kind of giving you a broader view of the other things that um, are out there uh, for your awareness. Um, so these are just a few other ways that the MAC might engage with the community as related to funding. So in, in, in addition to the tourism impact funds, so that 3% of that, the 10% of the 3%, um, we also have community investment funds. Um, these are different. These are um, allocated to the full board. It's about $70,000, an equal amount that everyone gets. Um, they have been getting them. You never know when they're going to say you don't get these anymore, but um, this is so, so our, um, that we uh, grant out to generally nonprofits for smaller projects. So, um, you know, they're relatively small grants, um, somewhere between $500 and $5,000. Our average is probably uh, $1,000 to $2,000 grants. Um, you know, Oh, I have examples um, a little bit on the, on the rest of the slide, but these are managed by me, me personally. So they can go a little faster than the tourism impact funds um, process because those need to be managed by the, the uh, county administrator's office. So 
Um, he has board members use these to support uh, community organizations. And um, these are SIF funds. So we have TIF funds and SIF funds. Um, the organizations who, well, there's a lot more than this, but these are just a few to highlight. Um, you know, Art Escape, Teen Services, Sonoma, we gave some to the forum for the bridge lighting, um, Grove Street Fire Safe Council. So it really runs the gamut. Um, and um, we often fund the, the volunteer firefighters as well. Um, and I, let me go back one second. Um, previous. Um, so these are, uh, these used to be called advertising funds and they were only for advertising. Um, that has changed and so they can be in support of, of events. So a lot of the ones that we're doing, it's, it's in the support of people's events, um, different nonprofits. So um, the, this isn't something that the MAC could access, but this is something certainly to be aware of and know that this is a resource that we have. Um, so the MAC funds, um, so your funds, right, your $10,000, those shouldn't be granted out to other organizations, but you can partner with them. But you can, if there are other organizations that you want to support or encourage, um, and these are just some ideas off the top of my head, this is not supposed to be exhaustive, but um, you could write a letter as the MAC um, expressing support for a new program or an effort within the community. Um, you know, you could also, um, encourage an organization to apply for community investment funds or tourism impact funds. Tourism impact funds, again, not just concerning the MAC, they're more restrictive because they were, uh, they were the will of the voters. So we have to be cognizant of that. Um, community investment funds are a little more, um, they're, they're a little more free. So um, not free money wise, but they're, they're a little more flexible. Um, so that, you know, it, but again, the, the amounts aren't that much, but it, it is a good opportunity for different organizations. Um, if you wanted to be really formal about it, you could even vote as a MAC to write a letter of support for an uh, organization for them to include in their application. Um, so this is just other ways you can partner. Um, and then, but do remember that every, every action does need a vote of the MAC to approve it. So, I went back and forth on which order to put these slides in. So um, there has also, it seems to me that there has been a little bit of confusion about ad hocs and what things need to be brought back to the full MAC and what doesn't. So I'm gonna try to clarify a little bit of that. And I will do my best to answer your questions and any questions um, that I can't answer, I will get answers for you. So first, I think we should look at the bylaws which um, outline what exactly these are. So you can just sub in the word ad hoc, that's what we say, but committees and subcommittees is the same. It's, it's synonymous. So the North Sonoma Valley MAC may establish single purpose committees or subcommittees consisting solely of less than a quorum of MAC members on an as needed basis by a quorum vote. All committees and subcommittees, so all ad hoc shall have a life of one year with the possibility of extension by the MAC after review. So that would be like a short-term extension. You can't just extend something in perpetuity. Um, the scope of work for a given committee or subcommittee or an ad hoc shall also be approved by the MAC by a quorum vote. We can be a little flexible on that um, if it's a simple committee that doesn't really need a big scope of work. The committees and subcommittees can conduct research, meet with members of the community, and develop recommendations to bring back to the MAC in an open and public meeting within one year. If the committees and subcommittees continue for a longer term, they will become standing committees and must comply with the open and public meeting requirements of the Brown Act. So that would be essentially having a second math meeting that um, you know, not only for you all, but also for staff, we would have to notice it and post it and et cetera. Um, so that's just like, it's always good when you're, when you're confused and I, I had actually forgotten this, it's always good to just go back to the bylaws. Um, and we actually have updated bylaws that I will send out um, I need to update the website with that too. Um, Hannah will send out the updated bylaws to you all so you can print them and put them in your binders um, because the ones you have, if you use your binders, um, because the ones you have in there are not accurate. They're, they're very similar, but um, so, so um, in common parlance, I take all this to mean that by creating the ad hocs, the MAC by definition kind of supports the, the purpose of the ad hoc, right? 
you, you all vote by a quorum to create an ad hoc and so you kind of support that. Um, the ad hoc should provide regular updates, verbal or in writing. We've always done them verbal, um, but you know, uh, the chair's discretion or, or if the MAC wants to, we could always do like written reports and have them be sent out with the meeting materials to save time at the meeting. Um, totally up to you guys. Um, they last for one year. Um, and the MAC writing a letter as the MAC uh, does need to be voted on by the MAC, um, right? Because it's an action of the MAC. Um, you know, as a MAC member, and we heard this at the vacation rental item um, at the board yesterday. I, I, I did. I watched the whole item until like 6.30 p.m. But um, there was a, someone who's on one of Supervisor Hopkins' MACs, the Coastal MAC, who called in and identified himself as, you know, I'm, this is my name and I'm a member of the Coast Mac and this is what I think and what my community thinks about vacation rentals. That's totally fine. If you were to do that as an individual in a letter, you can totally do that. But if the Mac is writing a letter, that does need to come before the Mac. Um, and then we had a couple recent items that, um, you know, we, we talked about it with and, and it was, it was kind of a, it was kind of comical um, that, you know, it was Chair, Chair Dawson wasn't here and Mark Newhouser wasn't here and both of those genesis came from them. So I think that might have led to some of the confusion there. But um, so, and this, again, this is my interpretation of, of what happened there. So the traffic and, and safety ad hoc letter request, I think folks were kind of confused about what they were supposed to do because there wasn't a letter. So there, I think Chair Dawson had requested that they write a letter but there wasn't a letter. And so was it a vote to have them write a letter or was it a vote that they could then write the letter and just send it in to TPW or what was that actually about? So to clear that up, you know, if, if there's a suggestion for someone to write a letter, you can let us know as long as before two weeks ahead of time and we can get it on the agenda, we can agendize that and say, we wanna present this letter. Um, you know, the letter is what needs to be voted on, right? And then you can have the discussion. The preparedness ad hoc, um, oh, sorry. Um, that was, my, my understanding of that was that it was sort of like a resolution supporting the work of the preparedness ad hoc. And that by forming that ad hoc, that the MAC kind of already supported it. So that's kind of where I thought the confusion from that came from as well. Um, I know that uh, because the preparedness ad hoc did apply for a grant, it probably would have been great to have a letter from the MAC to include in that grant application. Um, but I think that had already happened. And so I was also a little confused. So, so this is just my understanding and, and we can talk about this. I mean, that's why I put the slide at the end. So we, we can discuss these, um, but that's kind of my understanding. But in the future and uh, to be expedient, um, you should have the letter. It should be there for you know two weeks ahead of time if we have to do it where we have it noticed on the agenda, but the letter is not ready to send out two weeks ahead of time and we need to release that late, put it on the website and share it on the screen at the meeting, we can do that too. If we were meeting in person, you would print copies and have them there to pick up at the door, that would be fine as well. Um, and so just sort of in review, uh, moving forward, April is the last month for budget requests. Of course, unless there's something, or um, funding requests, unless there's something really dire, and then there is a, another process. You can have a special meeting, you know, you, you can do that. Um, but in as, as a matter of course, we should have the last funding request meeting be the April meeting. Um, we might want to work if, if the MAC wants to, and this is, um, Certainly it might be overkill and it is not a requirement, but if um, either the outreach committee or even a different ad hoc that wanted to form and cared about this wants to uh, work with our office to draft kind of a letter and logo policy, because I think there's been some questions about using the logo as well, um, that might be good just so people have a guideline. But again, I like rules a lot. So maybe people don't feel like they need that. Uh, this is not a requirement at all. It's just something that um, we're willing to do. And um, this last bullet, which I sort of rushed through the earlier part of this presentation. So I have it in my notes that this is a reminder, but it's actually just 
a reminder from previous presentations that you know if there was a large um, project that came either from or the community that you all think is a great idea um, I can see ways in which that wouldn't come out of your funding, that you wouldn't have to go through the budget process, right? And actually something, my old example of this was something from District 5, but currently we have the Glen Ellen Triangle and their beautification efforts that has moved a little bit along. Um, and I know Mark is the, or Chair, uh, Council Member Newhauser is the kind of liaison and he's been present at those meetings. Um, but that is something that it, it'll be expensive and we're certainly not expecting the MAC to fund that out of your limited budget, right? That's something that has been going on for a long time. The MAC is really helpful in kind of moving it along and having other perspectives, but um, that can come out of the Supervisor Gordon's Tourism Impact Fund. That's something she is supportive of. So don't think that, um, don't be scared to get involved in bigger things because you don't have the funding for it, I guess. Because depending on what it is, um, it, it could work out. It's also very difficult to talk about hypothetically because we don't like to talk about hypotheticals, but um, okay. So that is basically my presentation and I sort of rushed through it and I hope it made some sort of sense. Thank you, Ariel. Um, any any questions for Ariel? Oh, I'll, I'll jump in. Just um, uh, Council Member Hendren and I are planning to meet within the next couple of weeks and, and um, sort of draw up a protocol for um, for sending out letters from the MAC. So we'll we'll get that uh, probably the next meeting. Any other any other comments? I do. Yeah, Council Member Newhauser. Yeah, thank you, Ariel, for including this and for really um, creating some flexibility, if you will, in how to pursue this in the future. I really appreciate that. I realize, you know, putting in a request for a resolution while while I wasn't going to be at the meeting just complicated things. And, and, and I, I appreciate Damon stepping up and speaking for this, but what, what I was a little confused about was that it didn't appear that the document I submitted was included in the agenda packet for people to, to consider. So I, but I don't know for sure if that was the case. But I, I do think that some people were asking the question, like, what are we, what are we, what is he asking for? Because I had written a letter requesting uh, a resolution specifically to support future letters um, in support of our action, right? Uh, which was to submit grant proposals, um, you know, for the, the Fire Safe Council uh, or community development. And, um, and so uh, the reason why I asked for that was because in, in many of these cases, the timeline is so short for submitting these, these proposals that we don't have the six weeks or so um, to get something on the agenda, have the MAC meeting and get approval before submitting it. Now the workaround was we got a letter from, from uh, Supervisor Gorn, which was great. And we got letters from lots of people, um, uh, fire districts and other uh, elected representatives. That was a great workaround, but in the future it would be great to have a letter from the MAC. And, and anyway, I'm not gonna go on about it, but it, I, I think there was a little bit of confusion there but uh, Ariel's point was that we needed something more specific and that maybe the, the specific letter um, has to be approved. And so th there may just not be a workaround. And it may be that we will not be able to get a letter out in time if we have a short um, proposal timeline. Well, I would also say uh, if you had, and this is, I mean, I, and I think I had, I had mentioned this to you, but then you were, off doing something amazing, I hope. <laughs> um, but you know, you did have you had a template letter, right, that you sent out to folks because I, yeah. I did that for with Supervisor Warren. 
Um, and I know sometimes these things are really tight, like tight turnarounds. But if you had, if you think you're going to be doing the same application again, more or less, and you have a letter where the language would stay fairly stable, we could approve it in advance. And then just, you know, I, as long as the Mac is comfortable with the letter itself, the language mm -hmm. of the letter, if that was okay with everyone else, that's not a problem. Yeah, I, I think what I was looking for was was a support for a specific project, and that the flexibility be for um, what organization may be submitting it to, whether it be to the county or in this case it was the county and to Cal Fire. So I was hoping that that we could just basically have the gist of the letter be uh, approved by the MAC, and and then we could plug and play depending on the specifics of the title of the, you know, uh, of the proposal and the recipient um, uh, funding agency. So what, what do you want is a ministerial letter? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. But you know what? We may not even encounter this issue again. It's just that here we were trying to hurry up and meet the uh, qualifications for submitting this proposal. And it just, you know, I really was hoping to get something from the, from the MAC, you know, and, but anyway, it worked out. We, we didn't get funding from the county, by the way, just a quick update. Um, and I don't know if there's been um, a word back from, uh, from CAL FIRE yet or not. Um, but, but anyway, we'll, we'll see. But we may very well submit again because um, sometimes like, like the, the groups that got funded this year um, had applied before and were rejected. So I think persistence and reapplying, um, we've done the bulk of the work in developing these proposals. So I'm really hopeful that in the future we'll be able to get the funding. And, and you know, the sad thing is that here we got approval for funding from the MAC, a, a rather generous portion of our 10K, um, you know, to do precisely this work and, but if we don't have the, the, the Keystone funding from the granting agency, it'll be harder for us to utilize that funding from the MAC. So, you know, this is how the game works. But, um, but anyway, nevertheless, um, we'll, and, and I'll, I'll make sure that I'm more clear in my requests in the future and that, that I put forward a, a request for a resolution with an actual letter. So thank you. Thanks. Um, other comments or questions? All right. Well, let's um, we'll we'll support you in uh, yeah in, in the ad hoc and whatever way we can, Mark. We'll we'll do well, our yeah, best. Same goes for everyone else. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're all trying to get stuff done. Um, so let's move on to uh, item. So we're going to skip reports and announcements from the ad hocs and push that off to next month, and just go on to consideration of items for the future agenda. Uh, the three that were on here was a vacation rental ordinance update listing session. Sorry, from, through the chair, do we want to take public comment on the previous? Oh, um, let's see. Yeah, I guess we should. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, any public comments on um, on the MAC funding and letters of support? And I am not seeing any raised hands amongst our attendees. Okay. Um, so we're going to go on to consideration of items for, for the future agenda. The three that we have on the list on the, uh, on the current agenda is um, vacation rental ordinance update listening session with permit Sonoma, uh, fire agency update um, next month, which is that already in the works? I think it was a likely possibility for next month already. And then uh, bike paths and regional parks. Um, any other thoughts on uh, items for the future? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Vice Chair Doss. At some point, we need to take a look at appointments and uh, uh, terms of service on the MAC. And so maybe next month or the month after, I'm a little unclear, but we did speak about um, just making clarity or uh, moving the process along because our first year of operation is coming to an end. All right, thank you. And that reminds me, uh, we should also put on uh, uh, letters of support protocol. Uh, so like I was saying, um, uh, 
Council Member Handron and I are going to work that up for next month. So we should at least allow a few minutes to look that over and uh, those protocols and people can comment. Um, um, let's see, Council Member uh, Eagles. Um, you know, we, I, I think it was mentioned that the, the STC, some of the, the, the plans are going to be out in August, I believe, and we do have an ad hoc for that, which we should sort of dust off and understand our, our objective and maybe the, you know, we can talk and be on the agenda for next month. It might be a little premature, but I think we probably should sort of think about, about it sooner versus later. All right, thanks. And other ideas? Yeah, Council Member Dickey. Uh, just a comment. Um, we only had really the um, Susan Gorin's um, um, comments earlier tonight and then Scott Orr's presentation to us and it was two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. So I think whatever we decide that we wanna pursue as agenda items, let's make sure that we don't over agenda size our meeting time. Good point, yeah. Thank you, Matt. All right, last chance for comments. Um, and our, don't see anything on my notes about uh, public comments on this. Is that, I mean, I'm happy to take them, but if. Um, Technically you can take, you can slash should take public comment on every okay. agenda item. Yeah. But, um, I, I think that I scared most of our public away. <laughs> so I don't know that, I don't know that there is public comment on this. Well, just, just to be in the spirit of being open to, to public comment, uh, if anyone in the public would like to, suggest items for a future agenda, this is your chance. And I'm not seeing any raised hands amongst our attendees. All right, well, um, would someone make a motion to adjourn this meeting? I so move. And someone second that? Second. All right, all in favor of uh, ending the July meeting of the MAC, raise your hand or say aye. 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 And thank you, Ariel, for presenting to us tonight. Yeah. I wanted to get that in. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ariel. So oh, wow. the meeting's now adjourned at uh, 8.01 p.m. And thanks for hanging in there, everybody. And, and um, yeah, we're still working on the timing thing, but we'll, you know, it's some months are better than others. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.